Well, I guess this evening, um, I'm very pleased to have here, about a year ago, I first uh, saw Philip speak in Brighton, and I uh, was very impressed. And Philip is the founder of Credence, which is an organization dedicated to not only giving you information to live healthier lives and different lifestyles, but also giving you the things that you need to do those things. And I think the highest accolade I could give Philip was, um, I was speaking in Australia just uh, a few weeks ago, and one of the speakers at the conference recommended uh, one of Philip's books, the book on cancer, as one of the most important books you will ever read in your life. Uh, And I've also heard many other accolades from many people who have lived by the information that Philip has got to give. And really, I don't think you can have a higher recommendation than that. So I really hope you're going to appreciate very much that tonight we have with us Mr. Philip Day. Thank you very much. Very good evening to you all. It's nice to be back in Glastonbury again. Uh, We were last here probably about four years ago doing uh, talks. My long-suffering wife, Samantha, and I uh, pretty much are touring 10 months of the year around the world, uh, talking to people about how to avoid dying badly, how to avoid dying of diseases not even your livestock are going to die from. And we're going to tonight look and celebrate the new book out, is Simple Changes. And uh, I got the idea for this book. Do you know those exorable programs they put on Channel 4, uh, the 100 Most Embarrassing TV Moments? <laughs> those books. I thought, for goodness, I was sitting there watching one one day, and I thought, for goodness sake, let's give them a 100 list they can use. How about the 100 things you can start doing tomorrow to not only avoid dying badly, but also uh, to boost the amount of encouragement. There's a huge amount. My organization, as Andy introduced, Credence, my organization is interested in what works scientifically. So my job for the last 25 years as a health reporter, researcher, author, and so on is to travel around the world finding what's working and what isn't. Uh, One minute vitamin C is going to heal you. The next minute it's quackery. One minute fruits and veg are going to get you out of breast cancer. Um, And then the next in the newspapers, it's rubbish. And lots of you have been confused about all of this. And um, we're going to get to the heart of um, what the truth is. Simple Changes is, not desi- is, is kind of our umbrella book. It's our mothership book, if you like, uh, from which a lot of the other books follow. And we've looked into everything, cancer, AIDS, uh, mental health. How many of you know I'm not a big fan of psychiatry? Psychiatry is the study of people who don't need to be studied by people who do. <laughs> so... Uh, Don't get me started. Right, let's get going. 100. I'm going to do the countdown. You'll notice, you'll notice that I I will miss this. I will be here till 1 o'clock in the morning. So I'm going to roar through a whole bunch of these. But I want to give you a a, a kind of taster of how little you need to change in order to get some major benefits. Number one, who would agree you're never too old to change? You're never too old to change. Not only that, your past does not equal your future. Uh, So says Anthony Robbins. A lot of you know he's a world-famous behavioral expert. Just because you walked into this room with problems tonight or maybe you're here with some sort of illness or a loved one's got an illness does not mean to say that the future has to echo that. And um, one of the best ways to get change to happen is to be uncomfortable. I was speaking to a couple of you outside and, you, and, and, and they were saying, I really need to change. So I said, well, how badly, how badly uh, are you uncomfortable enough to change? And a lot of people are not uncomfortable yet. So if you're not, but you know you need to make a change, crank the pain up a bit. <laughs> And, uh, of course, discomfort prompts action. In, uh, in, uh, uh, immediate discomfort, of course, will prompt immediate action. So there are things, uh, sometimes people say, well, yeah, I need to change, uh, but I haven't got the time. Time is your most precious resource. You can lose a tenner, um, but you can always make another one, but you're not going to get today back again. So time, I say that not to get you to fear the reaper, but time is your most precious resource. And one of the best ways of using time is to ask one question. Um, In fact, ask it tomorrow morning. When you wake up tomorrow morning, always a good idea. Ask yourself one question. What do I wish to accomplish by bedtime tonight? What do I have to do so that by the end of today, I'm going to have have had the mother of all days? And the brain will immediately come out with things like, well, you need to do A, B, C, and D. And you need to do E and F because you've been procrastinating. How many of you figured out that your brain moves away from pain and moves towards pleasure? Have you noticed that? It's gone very quiet in here. How many, how, many of you, how many of you have got gym memberships and you never go to the gym? Bunch of liars. 
I'll tell you why. No pain, no gain. Have you heard that? The brain moves away from pain and moves towards pleasure. So the whole idea of working out is pretty good. It's just the grunting and sweating part we've got a problem with. And so the whole thing is no pain, no gain. So people don't. Um, Kathy Hilton was in the news uh, a little while ago. Uh, Kathy was um, quite slender when she met Kevin. Then she began putting on weight. And uh, she tried every diet, but diets fail because dieting equals pain. The brain doesn't really want to do it. So nothing worked. And finally, Kevin said, all right, Kathy, we've tried all that. Let's try this. If you can get yourself back to the size you were when I first met you, I'll buy you a brand new BMW. Seven stone, straight off. <laughs> Why? Because now dieting equals BMW. In the same way, I had a gym membership for four years, never went once when I was in my early teens. Uh, sorry, late teens, and then into my early 20s. And they'd ring me up every year. Do you want to renew this gym membership? Yes. Well, you never come. Doesn't matter. So they kept doing And I used to get dressed to go to the gym. I used to get in the car and drive to the gym, but I never made it indoors. I don't think I went to that gym uh, more than once in that four-year period. Anyway, after that, I moved to California, the land of the fruits and the flakes. And um, within one month, within one month, I was going to the gym four times a week. Why? Because the women who work out in the gyms in California wear next to nothing. <laughs> so a puerile example, but all of a sudden, I'm linking pleasure to going to the gym. So the whole point here is change your focus. And in the book, we get into how you do that. 97, avoid imagining the worst. Science shows that it generally doesn't happen. And the whole thing about avoid imagining the worst is that if you're constantly thinking about the worst that can happen, those of you who have read Rhonda Byrne's Secret and um, Bruce Lipton's book and uh, many others show that there's a link, there's this quantum morphogenetic link into what joins us all together that can deliver you what you dread but what you're vocalizing or what you're thinking about. Faith, by the way, in science is known as placebo. Have you heard of that? And placebo is, me is measurable at 60% effective. I had a lady in Solihull the other day came to me and she said, you're right when you say that because my granddad's stone deaf and he, was, uh, he had uh, liver cancer, went to the doctors, they opened him up in the, in the theater, cancer was everywhere, couldn't do a thing with him, so they sewed him back up again and sent him home. But he was so deaf and he was doddery that he didn't really understand what happened, but doctor had fixed him. Nine months later, he went back to the hospital for a checkup and when he walked in, the doctors looked like they'd seen a ghost. What are you still doing alive? Well, you fixed me when it was translated to him. He went home and he had no better sense than to believe that the doctor had fixed him. No trace of cancer in his entire body. So we'll look at the power of this a little bit later. But faith is the expectation that something good is going to happen. If you wake up in the morning and you think the universe has got it in for you, you've got a very different mindset towards what happens. And if you wake up and you think, no, I generally believe the universe is working for my benefit if I can be bothered to get out of bed in the morning. Be an overcomer. In other words, if you've got a problem, don't shy away from it. Don't get a government department to help you out of it. Face it and overcome it. Number one, if you start taking action, you'll notice that worry ceases. Lots of people worry. I get 4,000 emails a month, and a lot of that is, Dear Philip, I'm depressed. I had one the other day. Dear Philip, I'm frightened of dying. Dear Jack, the death rate is still one per person with a 100% hit ratio. You're all going to make it. Nobody gets out of this gig alive. There is a day in your future appointed for your demise. Didn't hear from him for three days. And he wrote back, what can I do? Get a life. <laughs> You're sitting there dying the death of a thousand cuts. Be an overcomer. Help others overcome. Before you leave tonight... Um, you'll pass just in, to our, our table is just in the table room on the left hand side get hold of a copy of both of those for free the left hand one is a half a uh, half an hour film of people a lot of whom were sent home told to go home and die and they disobeyed their doctor and they were in a pretty hopeless situation and hear it from them because I know you've got a lot of stubborn relatives if you notice how hard it is to get your relatives to do anything positive I mean I've still got members of my family dropping dead of cancer and they know I speak all over, all over the world on the subject, but they still, well, no, you know, we're going to follow doctor. You know, my aunt, bless her heart, my aunt um, had breast cancer. And I said to her, aunt, all you have to do, you know, just try doing a few of these things that I've been talking about. And she looked at me and she said, do you know, Philip, I remember when you were three years old, I used to watch you run naked through the lawn sprinklers. What was she saying? She was saying, I've seen your bare bum. How can you have the answer to what ails me? People aren't dying of cancer anymore, they're dying of an issue of credibility. That's the bottom line here. We've known for 80 years 
how to deal with cancer ever since Professor John Beard uh, did his famous thesis in Edinburgh University, which was promptly buried by the medical establishment. And you'll see that in the cancer book. It's very straightforward. Who here believes that you are what you eat? Who believes that? Some of you are not too sure. Who believes that if you eat burgers for 15 years, become a burger, basically? <laughs> Every cell in your body comes from what you eat. How many people believe that food can change your mood? Who believes that? Valentine's Day depends on it. <laughs> but they don't train doctors in nutrition. How dumb is that? Doctors are not trained in nutrition. Walk into any hospital at lunchtime, it's pretty clear that nobody in the entire building has even the slightest clue what food would do to the human body. Or they wouldn't be feeding bowel cancer patients with white bread. They wouldn't be giving hyperactive kiddies red slush puppies. In fact, doctors are required to swallow the most enormous paradox that food is apparently good enough to keep you alive, but it's not good enough to fix you when you're sick. And that is an intellectually inconsistent argument, isn't it? So we're going to look at making some simple changes. It's okay if you want to carry on eating what you're eating. Go ahead and do that. Make good choices. If you don't want to do, uh, die badly, there's basically some things you're going to have to do. If you wish to get the Queen's telegram with all your own teeth in your head, standing on your own two feet, cantankerous to the end, there are some things you're going to have to do, and there are some things you're going to have to stop doing. We have 18 cultures still extant, dotted around the planet, who don't get cancer. They don't get heart disease. No stroke is known in their culture. They haven't got dentists. They've got no speed cameras. They live 100-plus lifespans quite commonly. The Mir, the king of the Hunzas, which is a tribe up in the Himalayan foothills, and my organization trades with these people, the Mir, he, he routinely reports having people working in the fields past 110. A lot of them don't get beyond 115 to 120, but when they go down, it's normally with a hoe in their hand. They're not wired up down at four acres on a Thorazine drip with somebody taking 2,500 quid out of their account every month. So don't die badly is really the whole thing, and try to have useful longevity. So Food for Thought is a recipe book that gets into all of this. And uh, we look at a number of things, uh, a number of uh, uh, interesting concepts that uh, man has bought into. Milk, for instance, has always intrigued me. Why do we drink milk? Because if you look at the other animals, or if you look at the, the, the animal kingdom in general, milk, uh, we seem to be the only creature on God's earth to get weaned off our mother's milk, only to spend the rest of our lives stuck under the udders of a completely different species. So I'm curious about that. Why do we drink milk? Well, I asked my uncle. He's a big dairy farmer. Uncle, why do we drink milk? Why don't we drink, uh, why do we drink cow's milk? Why don't we drink uh, rat's milk so we can become slyer? Why don't we drink cat's milk so we can scratch up the furniture? Why cow's milk? And he scratched his head and he said, well, they're easy to catch and they stand still when you milk them. Don't ask such bloody silly questions. <laughs> But it, I'm, I'm just curious, if milk, all the other animals, that's what the word wean means. If you look up in the dictionary, wean, it says no more white stuff, you see. So if milk drinking had anything to do with logic, which it doesn't, we should be drinking human mother's milk. We should have factories up and down Britain, full up with women, connected up to, connected up to industrial milking machines. Anyway, we talk about these things in Food for Thought. Three books here, Health Wars, Why Have Doctors Become the Third Leading Cause of Death? There's an article, actually, I've just got it up here, um, Israeli Doctors Go on Strike and Death Rates Plummet. Apparently back, in, <laughs> apparently, back in 1973, doctors in Israel went on strike, and during the course of that strike, the death rate halved. In fact, admissions to hospitals dropped 80% because there were no doctors to help them, and the death rate halved. Um, a few years later, they had a strike at, uh, in Bogota, Colombia, where during the course of that strike, the death rate dropped 35%. My old home, Los Angeles, uh, actually had a go slow with doctors, and during the go slow, the death rate dropped 20%. And when the doctors went back to work, of course, it was killing as usual after that. Now, on, on the one hand, on the one, this is what we discuss in Health Wars. On the one hand, that's kind of a scary thing. On the other, it's kind of funny in a, in a macabre sort of way. But what it does say is it's, it tells us something so ghastly about what's become us, uh, of us as a society, especially when uh, doctors in America do not live within eight years of the general population in terms of their longevity. You've got to start asking yourself some questions. So when Health Wars came out in 2001, I wasn't really trying to pick a fight, but it really caused ructions in the medical establishment. And Phil Hammond, some of you know about uh, his Trust Me, I'm a Doctor series and his book, of course, which was excellent, came out and he was saying the same thing. You know, we've got these doctors, and let me tell you, I work with hundreds of doctors around the world every year. I'm not against doctors. 
Um, I don't think I met one doctor who did not go into medicine for all the right reasons. Here I am, I'm here to save the world, train me up. Uh, but the trouble is they get trained in institutions funded by the drug industry. And so we have a medical system where they've trained uh, doctors to make symptoms go away with drugs as if that's the same thing as curing the disease. Cancer, for instance, they're very good at making tumors go away, and they do it by a number of uh, quite interesting methods, uh, chemotherapy, poison, ex-chemical warfare agents sometimes. Radiation, how many, know, how many people know that radiation causes cancer? And surgical techniques. So the whole thing is to make the symptoms go away, but we know those tumors can and do grow back, and this frustrates a lot of oncologists because you know, despite their best medicine, people continue to die. Britain has the worst cancer survival rates of any Western industrialized nation. And the reason is they're not using nutrition. You can look on a website, the World Cancer Research Fund, which is WCRF, wish to be Charlie Romeo Foxtrot.org, and they have a 650 page tome on their book stuffed full of nutritional annotations for cancer, which have been completely ignored. So if you or somebody you love has got cancer, well, you need to read my book, and you need to find out what oncologists really think about the treatments they themselves wouldn't take if they had cancer, which is another of the hypocrisies that we see. Moving on, exercise. Walk 10,000 steps a day. Now, there were some studies just out about four weeks ago that say if you've got breast cancer and you want to halve your risk of dying, change your diet and start exercising. Three weeks later, another article came out and said, no, we made a mistake. That's not true. It is true, and in fact, we see all the time, in fact, in the 25 years I've been doing this, I've seen the dead get up and walk with this. Exercise is vital because it pumps the lymphatic system. Dear Philip, in 2001, I was diagnosed with stage four malignant melanoma with tumors in my brain, spleen, stomach, and lungs. I was given six months to live. What saved my life was a radical program of dietary changes, including much of what you speak about in your books and talks. Stage four malignant melanoma, that's when they send you home to clear out your bottom drawer. We have another one here. Dear Philip Day, thank you and congratulations on the work you're doing. I had your office send your cancer book to a friend in the USA and another in Guatemala. Both have been diagnosed with cancer. I spoke to them at length on the phone. Both are now recovered. Thank you, Dr. MF. Now, these treatments, these, these, um, this changing of diet and also uh, getting the patient to move around is pumping oxygen into their system. And cancer hates oxygen. Cancer is a system, and like any system, you can wreck the internal environment. It depends on to thrive. Um, but you see, mostly in, in Britain, if somebody's told they've got cancer, they go home and start behaving like what? A cancer patient. And a ca uh, rather than go out to the park and run around until they fall over, which is what they should be doing, and changing their diet. And we'll see that diet in a minute when we look at alkalizing um, and, and getting out of this acidic body system, which is the disease system. I mean, if you've got a stroke uh, problem or if you've had heart attacks or if you've had cancer, osteoporosis, arthritis, you are an acidic body system. And those Hunzas and the Azerbaijanis and the Vilkabambans, and I found towns in southern Georgia and southern Russia where you don't get to go on the city council until you're 100. Is that going to work up the road here? Hardly. They're all alkalized systems, and alkalized systems absorb huge amounts of oxygen. So if you are suffering symptoms of an acidic body type, um, reflux, have you ever had that? That's when you um, eat the hind legs off three wildebeest and half the Serengeti before noon, and two hours later, the whole thing comes up for a, comes up for a chat. And then we, <laughs> down goes the calcium carbonate to put the flames out. Uh, osteoporosis, arthritis, these are all indicative of acidic body systems. So oxygen is what we need to, to uh, sort out. Right, choose the right doctor. Avoid hospitals. There's, we're a culture that seems to love and revere sickness. Um, have you ever been on a train when somebody's just sitting there bending somebody else's ear about, oh, yeah, well, Mabel's taking these pills now, and then she's got to go to the doctor Thursday? And we love the whole thing about it. Um, here's another, here's another uh, tempestuous problem. Avoid medical testing disease. Um, that's the whole thing that if you think you're completely healthy, you simply have not had enough tests yet. All right, now doctors are always there, and, and don't get me wrong, you know, we need doctors, but we need doctors trained in nutrition. So when I say number 91, choose the right doctor, find somebody who knows what they're talking about in terms of nutrition. And uh, we talk about that in Health Wars. Next, put plants around the place. Some of you know about Cleve Baxter's research. He was the guy that got us talking to plants back in the 1970s, and plants communicated at a distance. Some fascinating um, information on that. But the other thing about plants is they found that plants 
are little filtration systems that will filter out volatile organic chemicals, hexane, toluene, the junk that comes off your fabric of your couch, um, and they will actually uh, purify the air. The other thing about plants is the whole uh, therapy side of it. You're tending another carbon-based life form, so that gets you off your own miserable, pathetic existence for a while and focuses it on something else. Uh, so it's the tending is the point. So put plants around the place. And uh, in the section there, you'll see the studies that show the great thing about that. Lose the mobile phone, number 89. We know all about the radiation problems with mobiles, but one of the big things that most people don't realize, which gets kind of um, ignored in the whole rush of, oh, you're frying your brain, is that mobiles make a spontaneous demand on your time, don't they, when they ring. You've got to come off what you're doing, and you've got to start dealing with that. And then the moment that phone's dealt with, you then get on with something else. Now, maybe if you just get one or two calls a day, that's not really a problem in that regard. But if you're getting 15 to 20 calls a day, what's happened to that question, what do I wish to accomplish by bedtime tonight? Come 3 o'clock, you've done absolutely nothing. And uh, I noticed that when I actually stopped using mobile phones uh, a number of years ago, I got my life back. All of a sudden, I could plot what I wanted to do and get through to the end of my day victorious rather than just get pulled away. Today, I get 4,000 emails a month because they find me a different way. But that's okay because at least they get it written down rather than I'm sitting there jabbering away to somebody over the phone and they don't remember or, or they're not writing down what I'm saying to them. So mobile phones, of course, the radiation is there. Do you remember this chap? Um, he took 1,300 fluorescent tubes, took them out into a field, plugged them into the soil and uh, under a pylon range, and there was so much voltage in the air, it lit them all up. Now, as I travel around the world, I come across towns like Tauranga in New Zealand, where they've got these pylons going down the streets. People are living underneath these uh, 400 kilovolt pylons or next to an uh, 11 kilovolt substation without realizing that they are bioelectrical beings. And so we get leukemia, lymphoma, and Tauranga, I always get half a dozen lymphoma or leukemia patients showing up, you know, Tauranga's cursed. No, the pylons are going down your street. That's what's happening. Dundee. Go to Dundee. They've got pylons going down the streets there. Dundee is famous for one of the, the biggest cancer hospitals in the UK called Nine Wells. Talk about a revolving door. They're starting to come up with this now, but they realize that there's a seven billion uh, pound problem in trying to fix where the pylons are. Right, limit caffeine, alcohol, and carbonated drinks. The reason is these strip vitamin C out of the body. Um, that's one of the major problems. Notice that these are all linked to heart disease. And heart disease in its manifest forms will generally be plaque in the arteries, which everybody's been told, oh, take statins. But uh, when the body is running short of vitamin C, it goes into, a, goes into a condition known as what? Anyone? Do you remember your history books? Scurvy. Only they don't call it scurvy today. They call it heart disease. Now, what's interesting is when the body runs short, you are made of something called collagen, and collagen is this tough, elastic, fibrous material the body uses to structure arteries. If you section an artery, it's made of collagen fibers that, that, that look like steel girders on a skyscraper, for instance. It forms the structure of who you are. Ladies, you know about collagen and skin, of course, and this is required uh, vitamin C, vitamin E, and two amino acids, lysine and proline, to form. Now, when you deny the body those nutrients, or worse, you're doing things that strip those nutrients out of the body, what happens is that the collagen structures of your arteries begin to come unglued, weaken. Now you're in trouble because your cardiovascular system is under pressure, blood pressure, and now you can pop an artery. And if you pop an artery, that's going to ruin your whole day. <laughs> so the body knows that, and so what the body does is it mixes up a type of glue, and it takes this glue and coats the inside of the arteries with this glue to cement up the cracks formed by the breakdown of the collagen. Does that sound familiar, that plaque? And that's the thing, bad cholesterol, bad cholesterol. You know, they've given us this kindergarten language. Uh, bad cholesterol, and here are some statins to make it go away. No, don't make it go away, because if you make it go away, then you'll come unglued, and then there'll be blood firing out of your nose and all the rest of it. The answer is, if you go and take vitamin C and vitamin E, that plaque washes away naturally. And that's the same thing as if you get one of those high vitamin diets and just go ahead and start eating fruit, as the sailors did when they hit port. Some of them were in a really messy state. And scurvy was a really complicated looking disease. Vitamin C um, is one of the most important things you can supplement with, but make sure it has the bioflavonoids. Ascorbic acid is not technically vitamin C, it's just one part of the C complex. So make sure that the entire complex is actually being used, vitamin C complex. Next, get a hobby. 
had belly dancing in Cardiff the other day. But that's Cardiff for you. Who's got a hobby here? Okay, hobbies are important because hobbies, it's, it's work home, work home, work home. This builds up stress. And um, Ivan Pavlov, you remember Pavlov's dog? Constant repetition forms brain patterns. Some of you have wondered why you catch yourself behaving in a dysfunctionally repetitive fashion. It's gone very quiet in here now. <laughs> and Pavlov found this out. Let me, let me demonstrate Pavlov's um, principle to you. Take a stick, take a Jack Russell, throw the stick, the dog runs off after the stick, picks it up, brings it back, you give the dog a biscuit, now the dog's brain is thinking, stick, biscuit, biscuit, stick, stick, biscuit. <laughs> it's making a connection between the stick and the biscuit. Next time you throw the stick, the dog's thinking what? Biscuit. You now have Pavlov's dog. You've linked sticks and biscuits in that dog's mind in a state of emotion, and you've repeated it over a 15 to 30 day period. What multi-billion dollar industry around the world runs on Pavlov's principle, anyone? Advertising. All they're doing is they're simply putting a product in front of you, linking pleasure to it, and then repeating that seven or to 15 times often over a, over a period of time, and the brain learns that. Smoking is a classic example of this. Um, notice that smoking has very little to do with nicotine in terms of the addiction because confirmed smokers like I used to be, I used to smoke 40 cigarettes a day in my early 20s. And um, uh, one girlfriend said, Philip, I'm not going out with you anymore. I went, why? She says, because I can never see you. <laughs> Surrounded by smoke all the time. But I noticed that I had no trouble, no trouble sleeping 8 to 10 hours a night straight off which if it was a chemical addiction, I'd be waking up every 45 minutes jonesing for a fag, and I'm not doing that. But when you wake up in the morning, now try going an hour without a cigarette, and you're climbing the walls. So smoking is a patterning problem, and nicotine hooks you quickly, but doesn't hook you deeply. And you can generally clear a nicotine addiction in about uh, six to 10 days, and there are a number of very good ways that you can do that. But it's mostly the patterning. Link link pain to the point of addiction. I gave up smoking in uh, six days using a bag of lemons. Every time I wanted, my brain wanted a cigarette, I'd take a lemon out of a bag, slice it in half, squeeze both ends into my mouth. Have you ever been dumb enough to do that? <laughs> Eyelashes, 4,000. Do, do it on public transport to really get the humiliation to kick in, you know? And uh, what you're doing is you're linking pain to the point of addiction. You know this because um, if you bite your nails, you go down to the, the pharmacy on the corner here, you get some nail gunk, you paint that on the nails. What's the purpose of that? <laughs> Aversion therapy. It links pain to the point of addiction. And then the brain moves away, like mine did after six days. And my mate did it with cayenne pepper. How, f <laughs> How fast do you think the brain learns being lit up like Baghdad at night, 250,000 <laughs> British thermal units? Getting a hobby simply breaks the Pavlov pattern. Work home, work home, belly dancing. Okay, so very important. I run a flight school. Not full-scale full, full scale stuff. This is boys in their aeroplanes, ladies, so just switch off. Fellas, look, look at this. Look at these planes. These are big machines. And these jets, this is a 250-mile-an-hour jet. All the while I'm doing this, I'm not doing this. Do you see? So what I'm able to do is completely divert my mind onto, onto different things. Own a pet. <laughs> Look like some of the people running this country, don't they, if you think about it. <laughs> Own a pet. Why? Well, they've done certain studies that show that pet owners have a much better chance of overcoming serious illness uh, than non-pet owners. And those of you who have pets know that they'll whine and whine and whine and won't let you die until you've fed them. And it's interesting that pets, pets don't have a, uh, they don't have a prefrontal cortex. So we have a conscious mind and an unconscious or a subconscious mind, which Dr. Bruce Lipton and um, Sheldrake and others get into. But dogs don't have the prefrontal cortex, so they don't have an awareness of self, which I think is kind of interesting. I wish they did. You know, we've got a Labrador called Rosie, and you won't see Rosie leaning back looking at her nails going, I could do with a bit of a clip coming up this Friday. <laughs> they, they're not reacting in that way. They have no awareness of self. They're purely, it's six o'clock, I want feeding. And woe betide you if you get to seven and you're not fed her, you know, because the patterning kicks in. And that's how you train dogs. You train dogs using Pavlov's pattern. You train kids in the same way. And notice that Pavlov is, is, the, is the carrot and the stick. So you can either link pleasure. If you want somebody to do something, you can link pleasure to them doing it, or you can link pain to them doing it. 
Either way, it's going to get a, a sort of uh, an inverse reaction, but the, the effect is the same. Next, drink two liters of water a day. And this is not Boddington's. This is two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen. If you're not drinking water on a regular basis, you're in drought management, sunshine. You may be experiencing things about your body that you think that you don't even link with dehydration. Well, I had some Nesquik this morning. Not the same thing at all. In hospitals, they don't, they don't think of water. They, the, the term they use is fluids. You know, and that can be everything from the whiskey tray coming around at 1 o'clock in the afternoon to Red Bull, you know, which is like molecular acid. It eats its way through 13 decks of the USS Enterprise. And um, I, I saw this guy going in and buying four cans of Red Bull in a, in a petrol station last week, and uh, he had this look about him, you know. He looked like a, a green-eyed psychopathic killer. He really did. <laughs> And, um, and I didn't say a word, but as he walked out, the lady behind the counter said, you know, that's what that does to people like that. <laughs> I didn't say a word. <laughs> One of the top water doctors in the world, Dr. Feridun Batman Jalish, we call him Dr. Batman. Water and salt. Look at that word salt. Your heel is from within. What have we been told about salt? Oh, avoid it like the plague. It's deadly. That's sodium chloride. How many minerals in sodium chloride, anyone? Two, sodium and chlorine. Real salt, Celtic salt, sea salt, or the king daddy of all salts, Himalayan salt, 84 minerals. And in their highly bioavailable form. Now, any farmer, I'm a farmer's boy, I'll tell you for nothing, if you don't put the salt blocks out for the cows, they die. You've got summer starting on Monday, and you need salt. Were you ever digging your garden and wiping the sweat off your brow, thinking, I won't have to be pleased when all this stuff's out of my body? Doesn't make sense to say that, does it? The body requires salt as an electrolyte, but not sodium chloride, which is a poison. There are many hundreds of salts in nature, so you need salt. You don't need too much of it, but if you've got a proper compound salt, the body will deal with any excess. If you stuff the body full of sodium chloride, you are, in fact, poisoning yourself. So they're right on that score. Uh, next, we're looking at live in the present. Number 80, live in the present. We've got people who live in the future all the time. My life's rubbish. My life won't be worth living till I get the new car, get the girlfriend, get the motorbike, get the new job, get the pay rise. Go to Ibiza. But in the meantime, they're constantly living in the future and the present escapes becoming known. And then we've got another lot who live in the past. The elderly do this a lot. England isn't what it used to be. Well, I've got news for you. It never used to be what it used to be, because back then it never used to be what it used to be either. <laughs> it's okay to live in. Notice that the subconscious mind, the subconscious mind that people like Lipton uh, um, amusingly refer to as a stimulus response jukebox, um, notice that uh, every time uh, an alligator leaps out of your bathtub, your reaction is always the same, isn't it? And you run down the road. But if you were the son of, say, Steve Irwin or somebody like that, you might turn around and go, how interesting, <laughs> depending on whatever you've programmed your brain to. But the subconscious mind only has the presence, to, uh, can only live in the present. It's the stimulus response jukebox. Every time you put the coin in, you get jailhouse rock out. At no time when you put the, the coin in and press jailhouse rocks will you, will you get crazy frog. It, so you hear people say, well, he just pushes my buttons. Well, the answer is yes. What he's doing is he's... he's selecting jailhouse rock, and you're reacting in exactly the same way. The conscious mind, which gives us an awareness of self, also gives us an awareness of past and future, which is interesting. But a lot of people will dwell in that, and the, and the, and the um, present escapes becoming known. It's a bit like when you're driving your car, and you've got your best mate or your girlfriend in the car with you, and you drive 40 miles talking to them, and you don't remember driving any of it. So the key here is to look in the mirror and see if you've left a trail of destruction behind you. The question is, who's been driving? Subconscious mind. So uh, in some of the books that we've got, and also uh, you know, we'll give you the books to go to to find out more about this, we can actually program out of our lives a lot of these destructive patternings. Anthony Robbins does it, Brian Tracy does it, Lipton and uh, uh, Professor William Tiller have done a whole bunch on this as well. Uh, I'm doing a tour series this year called Ghost in the Machine, where we look at the whole mind-body connection. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating. Next, simplify, simplify, simplify. In other words, lots of us are doing too much, and stress builds. And when stress builds, 
This causes the body to suppress the immune system. Stress also strips vitamin C out of the body. When vitamin C is stripped out of the body, that now lays you open to heart attack and stroke. When we look at uh, heavy coffee drinking, for instance, will have that same effect. Um, simplifying is all about just simply reprioritizing. What do I wish to accomplish by bedtime tonight? And then list it all out. Procrastination. Has anybody ever... <laughs> Let me explain. Procrastination is when you link too much pain to doing something so you don't do it until the pain of not doing it becomes more than the pain of doing it, so then you do it. Yeah, the brain, it is. The brain is, fo all that's happening is the brain is following the path of least resistance. So you need to get it. It's like, right brain, we're going to do it a different way now. We're going to do A, B, C, and D. We're going we're to program ourselves to be able to do the things that we need to do today and every day throw in one overwhelming optimistic experience. We're going to look at that a little bit later. Simplify, simplify. Never retire. <laughs> the insurance company has embezzled your pension fund anyway. But the whole thing about never retire is that it takes you off the sharp edge. The moment you retire and get the gold watch, what are you really saying to your cells? You're saying, you're washed up now. They replaced you with a younger, sexier model at half the money. So just go home and draw your pension out. Done. And you often hear about people retiring. Where's Jack? I've not seen him for six months. Oh, he passed away. Or his wife passed away and Jack went soon after. How many people know that you can program yourself to die? If a doctor turns around to you and says, well, the cancer's all over your body and you've got four months to live, many people go home and they die four months to the day, God forbid they ever disobey their doctor. You can program yourself to die. Half of the, in that testimonies DVD, you'll see people program themselves to live and this has the most awesome effect on your cells. You can talk to your cells in this way, in the same way that Cleve Baxter was able to do it with plants. We'll look at his work a bit later. But never retire. Keep working, keep doing what, what fuels you up until your need for oxygen ceases. Now, there's a 91-year-old who cleans our offices. She's known as Fang Ash Lil. <laughs> and she cleans our offices, works, she just works like a slave. I put her in extreme good condition down to the fact that I work her like a dog. I thrash her hard, man, I'll tell you what. I've got two others, including my dad who worked for us, um, over 80 years of age, I work them cruel. And uh, the great thing about employing the elderly is that they don't phone you up on a Monday morning going, I'm not coming in today, I'll write Bender over the weekend. You don't get that with them. Well, one of them you do. <laughs> but they know, how many people know that 80-year-olds know a lot of stuff? They really do. And the whole idea of tossing them out of the workforce is absolute rubbish, it really is. This whole idea of insuring against this and insuring against that, and health and safety, who's come across them? <laughs> but listen to you. The whole of England is groaning at health and safety, and these little Nazis are walking around. Do you know they've actually stopped kids having uh, conquer fights in Kent now? In fact, no, they banned cross-country running because apparently it's child abuse. <laughs> I thought that was the whole point. You can't put your kid on a, uh, on a donkey on Bognor Beach anymore and ride them down the beach like you used to, unless they're wearing a full-face motorcycle crash helmet. We allow these petty fogging jobs words power over us. We allow them to do this. And that's us to a T, isn't it, the British? Oh, well, I don't really like that very much, but I'm not going to do anything because I'm too comfortable. So suffer what you must suffer. If this country doesn't get up and do something soon, it won't even be our country anymore. Next, be reliable. Jesus was born on a bank holiday. <laughs> visited the temple on a bank holiday and died on a bank holiday. It's a pretty good bet that when he comes back, it will also be on a bank holiday. <laughs> be reliable. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Don't be a flake. People are relying on you. Next, reconcile your fear of death. Every single one of you, every single one of you must ask the four big questions. Here they are. Who am I? Where did I come from? What am I doing here? And where am I going when this gig is over? <laughs> Can you see that depending on your answers to those questions, you can interpret life in an incredibly different way. If you believe Richard Dawkins 
an evolution, then you're nothing but a piece of pond scum that washed up on a beach four and a half million years ago and then began evolving into the splendid creature you are today in spite of the second law of thermodynamics that actually states you're devolving back into pond scum and you're so far along in the process, <laughs> you can't figure it out. <laughs> if you believe that, then your whole idea of, well, yeah, my life is really essentially worthless. I'm just this cosmic burp and I'm going back to stardust. Why bother getting out of bed in the morning? There are plenty of people who don't. Plenty of people ring me up. I'm, how they even bother ringing me up is a, a miracle in itself. <laughs> What's it all about? I've lost my way. I'm 45 years old and I've lost my way. I don't know what to do. What's it all about? What if the hokey cokey really is what it's all about? <laughs> and then they put them on drugs or they, get, they go to a psychiatrist as if they're going to give them answers. Here's the thing. Develop a belief system that gives you a context for why you're here. Very important, that. What I find fascinating is there is evidence for design everywhere. When you look into the, uh, the subsections of the, um, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the cells, uh, Deepak Chopra and Anthony Robbins did this amazing interview on TV. I remember I was uh, cruising through Alabama, of all places at the time, listening to it on the radio. And Chopra was saying, well, cells communicate at a distance, but we wanted to find where the brain was in the cells. There is no brain in the cells. You know, if your cells respond to peanut butter, there's no brain in there that makes them do that. They're really reacting to an external influence, which Lipton, of course, calls uh, the more, or Sheldrake calls the morphogenetic field. But uh, Chief, uh, uh, Deepak said, well, we look in the cells. No, can't find the brain there. So we go into the tissues, not there. We go down to the particles. We go to atoms, subatomic particles, nothing there. What we end up with is no stuff. Thinking, no stuff. Surrounding us, everything relating to everything else. And what's interesting is when you start looking into how the body works, for instance, why does eating an apple and a tomato a day give you amazing benefits? Um, the answer is, well, tomatoes are full of lycopene. We've got an absolute epidemic of infertility in this country. We've got lazy sperm. So what we need to do is pump them up into super sperm. Lycopene does that. Um, and apples, of course, uh, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Apples not only contain a very rich group of nutrients that go in, but the other thing about apples is they contain seeds rich in a substance that has come to be known as vitamin B17, which is deadly to cancer cells, selectively deadly to cancer cells. You hear about um, apple seeds, but most, mostly you hear about apricot kernels containing the highest levels of vitamin B17 of any food on earth. And while apricot kernels are not the cure for cancer, Cancer is a, a multifactorial metabolic problem. It's a very important part of the support structure. So in my cancer book, I get you into not only doing all the things physically to fix the situation, but also using this as well. Your thoughts affect your biochemistry. And on a conscious level, remember, we're back to the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. On the conscious level, some people who've got cancer go, no, it's not going to beat me, I'm going to beat it. But subconsciously, they grew up in an era where if Jack got cancer, that was it for him then. And so there's always this undercurrent of hel helplessness. And so often when I speak to people with cancer, uh, they say, I'm going to die, aren't I? I say, well, not on my shift, you're not. Are you willing to get stuck in and do something? Oh, I don't know. The doctor says it's hopeless. Okay, but what, the doctor's not in your body. What do you think? Are you willing to get stuck in and do something about this? Well, I might as opposed to the people who adopt what I call the damn the torpedoes attitude. Yep, I've got more to do. I'm not checking out just yet. And they can communicate that to their cells in a very, very fascinating way. In fact, I noticed posters out there from a meeting that's going on at, on the South Bank up in London that Lynn McTaggart, she of What Doctors Don't Tell You, is getting together with Bruce Lipton, Sheldrake, and a, a number of others. Well worth going. It's a green flyer. Go along to that. It's going to be a fascinating evening, and they're going to be talking about all of this. See the world and have no fear. Coming through Idaho on my last American tour, Idaho, has anybody ever been to Idaho? It's not quite the end of the world, but you can see the end of the world from there. <laughs> and Idaho, it's like miles of desert, and then there's civilization. And, um, and, they said to, uh, and they said to me, well, we'd love to have your lifestyle. What, airports and taxis? No, you travel everywhere. I go, well, it's really not that glamorous. Uh, we'd love to come to Europe. So come to Europe. Oh, no, if Americans go to Europe, they get their heads cut off. Who told you such a thing? CNN. <laughs> so one of the things I'm here, well, it's, it's going to come up on a slide a bit later. Avoid the national media. This is a placebo, things that build immunity and confidence. Nocebo is everything that crushes immunity and confidence. There's no good news. 
In fact, tomorrow morning, pick up the newspaper. I was just across having a, a beer in the um, tavern across the road, and there was somebody left a Daily Express behind, so I had to look through it. And um, next time, you, tomorrow morning, get a newspaper, get a red pen out, and put a big red X next to every single article that is bad news. Go through the newspaper, just put a big X, and when you get to the TV, do all the TV programs, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Murder, She Wrote, Midsummer's Murder, Murder in Suburbia, Murder with Frost, Dead Like Us, Cult of the Coffin. Go through the whole lot, and then this time, then get a blue pen, get a blue pen, and go through the same newspaper, and put a big blue X next to every single article that is absolutely none of your business. It's got nothing to do with you at all, and yet you're just plugged into that whole thing, tossing yourself under the bus, a bus as we say in Maidstone. Just doing your head in all the time. So here's an experiment. Go for 30 days without reading a newspaper or watching the news. God knows how you'll do it. Because you've been patterned, you've been patterned to do this all the time. And you'll notice that after 14 days, you get your innocence back. It's, it's, an, it's an incredible experience. What's going on in the world? Don't care. Well, you're burying your head in your sand. You like those ostriches? No, no, no. You know, if something bad happens to Glastonbury, I'm going to hear the bang. Until that time comes, I'm just going to get on doing what I'm doing. The local press is quite handy. You know, the local press has got some good news. Fireman saves old lady's cat up tree. <laughs> well, it's happening around the corner from you, so it's a bit more relevant when you think about it, isn't it? Does my head in. Laugh a lot. So laugh a lot. Laughing's pretty darn funny. Laughing boosts the immune system as well. And laughing, laughing at your mountains is one of the best ways of taking power out of them. If I see somebody who's suffering from depression, depression's a terrible thing in this country. Many people have got it, and a lot of it is what they plug their heads into. But did you know that 25 to 42% of all depressives, according to the University of North Carolina, are chromium deficient? And if they're chromium deficient, they're also having problem processing sugar so that can move them into the precursor to diabetes, which is known as Syndrome X. We have many people in this country flirting with diabetes right now. Um, they're peeing a little and often. They've got a constant dry mouth. and They're not sleeping too well. They're moving in that, that way. There's a whole list of these symptoms in the books. And for the want of exercise and also just getting proper food into them, and you can do chromium supplementation, 400 micrograms a day, and just do some fish oils and a few things like that. 25 to 42% of depressives according to Professor Malcolm McLeod uh, in North Carolina, will come out of depression, and a marked uh, difference will be seen in about three or four weeks. Now, that may or may not be the, the cause of depression. There are many other causes, and we deal with those in, in the ABCs of disease and, and other books like that. But um, that's a healthy slug of people who are not feeling so good, who are also plugging, them into, plugging themselves into all the bad things that are happening to the world. And if you think about it, if you didn't have newspapers or you didn't have TV or what have you, there's an awful lot of bad things that are going on in the world that have gone on in the world in the last 10 years that you would be completely ignorant of, that you've never had any really handle over anyway, but they have affected you in ways that you're not really aware of. Pay attention to chronic conditions. A chronic condition is simply a condition that if you don't do something about it, it won't go away. And while most chronic conditions are baggage, if you like, some of them can be quite serious and lead on to things. So if you're suffering from any kind of chronic condition, find out about it. I've got a book out the back, which the European Union are desperate to ban. It's called The ABCs of Disease. If you're going to die of anything, it's in this book. <laughs> and a lot of the non-fatal baggage you carry around with you will also be in there. And also with the regimens required to give you the optimum shot at getting out of these. Now, I didn't just pull these out of the trees. What I've done is I've looked at the clinics around the world that, are, that, are, that have the major effects of reversing cancer, getting people out of uh, stroke disabilities and things like that. What is it that they're doing? What is working? And we, of course, um, science has brought a lot of studies out that will back this up as well. But clinical evidence is what I really enjoy because clinical evidence doesn't necessarily face the harshness or the sterility of a scientific study because um, in clinical cases you're dealing with the patient's mental approach to what's happening to them as well, which is very important. How many business owners here? People who own businesses. Okay, there's a great book. You can get it off our website. I don't know that we brought it along with us this afternoon. But if you're a business owner, it's called Purple Cow, and you need to read this book. It's How to Be Remarkable. And uh, the name of it uh, was given by the author Seth Godin, who was taking his family through France. And France is quite a spectacular country in terms of its scenery. Um, 
you know, if you, especially if you go down through the middle of it, you've got all the cows up against that lovely lush background. And cows are pretty spectacular in France until you've seen 200 of them and then cows are boring. And so the more cows you see, it's just another cow. So that's your business. Maybe over a period of time, your business has gone away and now you've got a chronic business problem setting in and you need to refresh it in the same way that if you've got a chronic health problem, you can just turn a corner and start doing something new. Seth Godin will show you how to breathe to become a purple cow, which will suddenly get people, you know, st uh, sitting up and having a look and saying, wow, what's new about this? So it's a good, it's a good book and it touches on a lot of the um, uh, mental approaches we're going to look at in the second part when we get to 50 and start counting down. Pay attention to chronic conditions. The chances are um, they're in the ABCs of disease. There's a couple of great websites I want to give you. Um, I'm going to make some recommendations tonight. I'm not personally or commercially linked to any of these companies, but I think they're doing a great job. Um, one of the top uh, internet doctors is a guy called Dr. Joseph Mercola, and you'll find him at www.mercola, M-E-R, M for Michael, E-R, C-O-L-A, mercola.com. And another great site is doctoryourself.com, doctoryourself.com. Uh, another quirky but uh, favorite side of mine is thedoctorwithin.com, thedoctorwithin.com. By far the best site out there I've found so far, philipday.com. <laughs> and it's got a fully searchable um, index in there, so you can get in there and, uh, you know, if you're suffering from cancer, put it in there and it pulls up stuff on cancer. Diabetes pulls up stuff on diabetes. Even some of the rarer conditions, you can type in uh, uh, Kawasaki disease and it pulls up a list of dealerships. Take a four-week holiday. Now, if you've been going work home, work home, you've been building up the Pavlov patterns, you're stressed to the eyeballs. Now, the only way you can de-stress is by physically removing yourself from where you've been building the patterns. Does that make sense to you? But four weeks, that's the Pavlov period. Most people are going off for two weeks, they're coming back with a tan and the t-shirt, but they've still got bats in the belfry because they have not overwritten those patterns over the four-week period. In fact, if you're stressed out or sometimes, you know, Philip, I'm at the end of my tether. If you're at the end of your tether, you need to take at least four to six weeks away. You must do that. If you don't do that, then suffer what you must suffer. You'll move into what your parents used to call a, um, a mental uh, breakdown or a, a nervous breakdown. Today, they call it one of 374 mental illnesses complete with their own insurance billing codes. But at the end of the day, you've just been burning the candle at both ends. You've been jamming the needles to the red and smoking the rubber to the cord. You need some time away. And the worst offenders are the self-employed because they're like Labradors. They don't know when to stop eating. Work, 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 and down they go. All right, so you often get this from self-employed people. Well, that's all very well and good, Mr. Day, but if I left for even one week, my business would collapse. They are, they're already in trouble. They're patterned to the point where their patterning is now saying, no, you can't take a holiday because your business will crash. Can you see how deadly that can be for them? 65, listen to what comes out of your mouth. It's a good indication of when to take the four-week holiday. <laughs> Have you ever suddenly you just... Do you know, President Andrew Jackson of America, when they buried him, he had a massive state funeral... And uh, it's the most incredible occasion, apparently, according to the history books, um, apart from his parrot. And his parrot had to be removed from the proceedings because it was swearing so badly. How do you get a parrot to cuss? Pavlov. Just to give you another example of how constant repetition of the same thing will, uh, will make it happen. Those of you learning skill sports like table tennis, tennis, cricket, and those types of things, you see a skill increase after about 25 days as the Pavlov principle cuts in, and the brain learns it. What's happening here? Do you, can you remember, you know, I gave that, in, that example of you uh, going down the motorway for 45 minutes and uh, who's driving the car because you're talking to your friend or your girlfriend or what have you. Well, do you remember when you took your driving test? <laughs> the conscious mind. That's the conscious mind driving. The subconscious mind is elbow out of the window, you know, like this. Conscious mind is like that. And this is the whole point. When you are moving into stress, the conscious mind will give way to the subconscious mind. And when that happens, you become dumber. Have you noticed that when you panic, you become thicker? And the reason is that you go from the conscious mind to the subconscious mind. And the subconscious mind is a stimulus response jukebox. That's all it is. 
And so you sometimes, next time you panic, you say, oh, Philip was right, I've become thick. Can't even remember what I did with my car keys, those types of things. So listen to what comes out of your mouth. Avoid psychiatrists. I hope we got the sound plugged in. Let me see if I've got this working for you. This will give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, there we go. We've got something coming out. No, nope, guess not. Maybe it'll start playing in a minute. Uh -huh. This is a group of psychiatrists. Psychiatry in all of, uh, all of this time doesn't have one case report of one disease validated, not one. What they do is they meet at the American uh, Psychiatric Association, they meet in the DSM committee, Diagnostic Statistical Manual Committee, and they vote on making new behavioral and, and emotional disorders and they vote, and then they start immediately calling them diseases. And they tell people, they tell the public these are diseases. Total fraud. Total fraud. The actual truth about chemical balance is that it's an actual lie. Nobody has yet measured, demonstrated, or created a test to show that somebody has a chemical imbalance in their brain. Period. What the American public should be thinking about is when they or their loved ones or their friends have received a psychiatric diagnosis, they should be asking the dog, geez, dog, where's the, where's the chemical test for that? Where is the objective test for this? And I guarantee you that they'll be told, uh, we don't have a chemical test for that. There are no biological tests for any mental illnesses that I'm aware of. There are not uh, current available tests uh, to verify your diagnosis. There is no test. There is no specific test to differentiate between, let's say, schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Not a single test. Yeah, we have no, not really uh, confirma confirmatory test for the diagnosis. There is no test, there's no biopsy you can do that says uh, this person is depressed, this person is bipolar. We don't have anything really currently to identify uh, mental illness per se. No, there are no specific tests to confirm the diagnosis or show the improvement like any blood tests or any x-rays or anything like that. Oh, in my practice I don't do any tests. I just speak with people and uh, listen to them and then I make a decision in what kind of illness so there should be. Uh, we don't have, we don't really have any specific blood tests or other tests that are definitive for any mental illness whatsoever. Um, what kind of um, biological tests do we have available today for detecting mental illnesses? None. <laughs> there is no rational science behind what they think is the cause of these symptoms. The medications that are being given to people are, without exception, introducing chemicals that are altering the brain in ways which can be very damaging. And I'll go a step further and say that in the absence of a proven chemical imbalance for which the medications are, quote, rebalancing or fixing, the medications are, in fact, toxic. How many patients have you been able to cure so far? <laughs> I would say one. <laughs> How many people have I cured? Well, uh, there are no real cures right now in psychiatry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> idea of any, uh, you asked me about the issue about how many people I've cured. I don't know that any of us are ever completely cured of anything. I have not been able to cure many patients. I have cured none of my patients. All right, next. <laughs> Remove toxins from home and work. There's an awful lot of stuff around the house that is poisoning us by degrees. So it's very important to be able to get those out and replace them with safe alternatives. Next, avoid cancer. And uh, for that, we have um, a couple of books. We've got that one there. The one below it, the white one, 
is the much more technical version that we've done for the medical uh, fraternity. And it hasn't been completely ignored. We've got doctors all over the world that have set clinics up based on the information. And Steve Ransom's excellent great news uh, on cancer in the 21st century that we'll get into the things to avoid. Reduce or eliminate dairy. Um, the, the, the only really good milk that was worth drinking was not only a mum's milk, but also certain types of raw milk. Today, of course, milk is pasteurized, so it's essentially a junk food and comes with uh, a lot of uh, cows in other countries are jacked up with uh, things like estradiol, um, diethyl still bestrol. These are estrogens. And how many people know we live in a society drenched in estrogen? We got, yeah, there's uh, millions of women taking birth control pills, peeing into the water supply. Those estrogens are not being taken out. And so up and down the country now, we've got boy fish becoming girl fish in the rivers. We've got girl gulls nesting with girl gulls. Um, you go down to Folkestone, there's so much uh, estrogen in the English Channel, you have to say please before the title come in. <laughs> Get a basic supplement program. Now, you don't need to spend 300 quid a month on supplements. You really don't. Not even with me, you don't. What you need is you need a good, balanced, alkalizing diet, and you need the basics. And the basics are really just to shore up and to cover the bases in case you're not getting them. We have a mineral deficiency going on in the soils. It's interesting that with all the floods that have been going on, I haven't seen one specialist actually say, well, actually, flooding replenishes the minerals in the soil. And since we've been building all of the flood barriers around the country to reclaim land, that hasn't been happening. And so farmers have been taking crops out of the soil over, over the centuries. And so our soils are minerally just wretched. Over in Kent, copper is 76% out of the soil. We've got a 48% deficiency of calcium in the soil now. And so a carrot isn't a carrot anymore. It may look like a carrot, cut like a carrot, cook like a carrot, and throw like a carrot but it essentially doesn't have the, the, the mineralization that carrots once used to have. So it's important to make sure that you are minerally bolstered. A good liquid uh, ionized colloidal mineral supplement is good. I, I basically supplement with um, those things you see on the screen. I haven't had a day's illness in 25 years. I've even been eating apricot kernels, which the government says, if you have more than two, you'll die. I've been taking seven grams a day for as long as I can remember, and nothing's happened to me yet. Be in love. Why? Just do it. <laughs> Turn off the TV. The thing with TV, did you know that TV pulses at 10 hertz? 10 hertz is in the 8 to 12 hertz range of an alpha state, and an alpha state is a mild hypnotic state. The deeper states will be delta and, uh, and theta. But alpha is the suggestive state. It's the state you go into when you meditate, and some people meditate much deeper than that. It's the prayer state. It's the state that people like Lipton and Sheldrake say is when you communicate with whatever's out there. In other words, the, uh, the primary perception plane, as, as Baxter called it. Any Christians here, it will be the Holy Spirit. It'll be the level that you're praying into. But it's done in an alpha state, and that's the same state that TV puts you in. If you ever watch somebody uh, watching TV, they look like this. And advertisers love that because you can be programmed. Some of you, in fact, most of you can't remember prior to your second birthday because when you were born, your brain was basically in a gamma with, pass, uh, with um, uh, proportional delta ranges, which are much lower ranges, and that's the downloading. Babies download a huge amount of information over the first uh, two to four years of their life and um, download water is wet, fire is hot, I'm no bloody good. All of that goes into the... A lot of that goes into the subconscious, and so later on, that child can go on to become Britney Spears or a captain of industry, but deep down, they're no bloody good. The subconscious is running everything. So when we come up with people with depression or people with uh, various um, immune system issues or cancer, we need to get into their life a bit. And generally, if somebody phones me up and they say, oh, I've had cancer, how long you had it for? Well, three years. What was going on in your life four years ago? There's generally something that's happening there. Or there's, um, if there's not, then there's some chronic long-term stress that's happened to beat them down over the years. And TV would have the same effect, um, will have the same effect on you in that way because TV is, is amazingly suggestive in that respect. So uh, if you can't do without it, limit the amount of viewing. We've got a book um, you can get off our website by Dr. Eric Sigmund uh, called Remote, uh, Remotely Controlled. It's one of the most terrifying books I've read recently. And it gets into not just what you're seeing on the screen, but the dangers of the medium itself. 
and uh, how it can um, affect hormones and the rest of it. Next, 49, sleep in pitch darkness. Get enough sleep. If you're sleeping with lights on, that's affecting the production of um, melatonin. And melatonin deficiency has been linked with breast cancer, ladies. So turn the light out, complete pitch black. Is anybody doing that right now, just sleeping, making sure that there's absolutely no light? Yeah, you need to set your alarm clock because you will oversleep and the boss will chew you out, but uh, you will uh, refresh yourself much better. Avoid vaccinations like the plague. I don't think I really need to explain that to an audience that we're talking to tonight, but we do have a book on it, Wake Up to Health. If you are in any doubt at all, any one of you, about the, the long-term damage that vaccines do to you, pick up this book and read it, and don't do it again. It's a filthy, disgusting, abominable ritual that got put into our society and has no basis at all, either with medicine or with uh, a society that deems itself civilized. Avoid too much sun, but the other side of this is make sure you get enough of it. Not much danger here at the moment, is there? <laughs> yeah. Um, I noticed that um, when I go down to Australia, they say, well, all our kids have to wear hats because the sun's deadly, because a big ozone hole has been ripped open. No, it's actually because your diets are rubbish down there. The same as our diets are rubbish here, and over in America, where I lived for a while, the, rub the diets are rubbish there. You become much more vulnerable to damage. Remember, cancer is a healing process that hasn't terminated upon completion of its task. And so if the sun hurts you, a healing process begins, and if it doesn't switch off, you're being healed site-specific to the original area of damage, and we call that a tumor. And so that, of course, makes sense with smoking. You damage the back and the throat and the lungs with your cigarettes. A healing process begins. Clearly, smoking doesn't cause cancer, because if it did, everybody who smoked a cigarette would get cancer, and that's not happening. But clearly, there's a, there is a severe risk factor involved. So it's been my interest to try to find out why somebody like Fag Ash Lil, for instance, can smoke 40 cigarettes a day since the flood of Noah and not even have a cough, and yet people can get lung cancer not even smoking. And it's down to immunity. So what we're all about here tonight is building an immune system in you like a blast furnace. And you need the sun to manufacture vitamin D. What happens if you take a plant and shove it in the closet, close the door? It dies. So again, there's all this panic going on right now, all about, um, not just about health and safety, but also, oh, you must cover up, otherwise something horrible is going to happen. Attack political correctness. Nay, throttle the life out of it. These minnows that are out there doing this to us, and we're just sitting back and letting it happen. If you don't like it, you must start doing something about it. Um, a good website to log on to is the Campaign Against Political Correctness. That's at capc.co.uk. C, Charlie Alpha, Papa Charlie.co.uk. And of course, we move into the whole um, European Union thing, which is this uh, foreign conquest that's happening by stealth at the moment. Those of you who actually do care about this, if you log on to our website at uh, philipday.com, two L's in Philip. My mother was drunk when she signed the birth register. <laughs> philipday.com. And go to uh, watch films online you'll see that there's a film there about the EU. It's a documentary that we made called The Real Face of the European Union. Get interested because once this takeover has happened, the only way you can ever get free of it is by war. And it's incredibly dangerous what's happening right now. I don't know if David Shaler or any of the others t uh, speaking tomorrow are going to get into that, but it's a very, very topical subject right now. Um, you're, simply going, you're, you're now being ruled by people you cannot sack. And that's a very dangerous situation. Create overwhelming, optimistic experiences. Once a day, throw in something that's your jollies for the day. I use them as a bit of a bribe. Sometimes I have two. And it's a bribe to get me to do the things I'd rather not do. So my day will start, what do I wish to accomplish by bedtime tonight? A, B, C, and D. E and F, because you're being procrastinating. G, overwhelming, optimistic experience. And then when I get back in the bed uh, that night, I do a bit of a debrief. This process takes 35 to 40 seconds. Don't labor over it. If you're going to take longer than that to do it, then do it again. It's got to be a snap decision. This is what I'm going to spend my day on tomorrow. And this is the most efficient form of time you can, uh, a use of time that you can get. Eat garlic. Now, garlic has been known for years, and of course, it's got a long and proud history, and I don't have to get into that. But uh, recently, they've uh, isolated the engine of garlic, which is known as allicin, A-L-L-I-C-I-N. And allicin... Uh, when you hear about garlic doing all the great things, that's allicin. And allicin is basically the sulfur and oxygen bonds in garlic that uh, have a, a number of remarkable effects. They are incredible immune boosters. 
allicin is deadly to fungi and yeast. It will kill uh, MRSA in concentrations of just 16 parts per million. It kills the most, le the most lethal form of E. coli, known as E. coli 0157, in concentrations of 32 parts per million. Um, it deals with everything, warts, wounds, vampires. Uh, it will deal with uh, mosquitoes. If you get bitten by mosquitoes and you take a couple of allicin capsules when you go on holiday, the mosquitoes um, don't come near you. Hopefully the local talent will. Mosquitoes won't. It's good for bowel problems, irritable bowel syndrome. Do you know, if you take the words irritable bowel syndrome and rearrange all the letters, using every letter, you get, oh, my terrible drains below. <laughs> Manage your anger. I have a tremendous amount of anger towards politicians. How about you? I believe that's why they call it politics. Poly, many, ticks, blood-sucking parasites. <laughs> have you any idea how much they're costing us now? If you work out what they actually cost us, it's, it's absolutely insane. It really is. And you could be forgiven for thinking that you're dealing with just such incompetence, which is probably the reason why if you take the words the Houses of Parliament and rearrange all the letters, you get loonies far up the Thames. <laughs> Managing your anger is all about taking the power out of what's bugging you. And we get into this in the Little Book of Attitude, which is a book I brought out uh, three years ago. Uh, so if you're here tonight and you think you need an attitude adjustment, there, there, go ahead and take that home with you. Reduce or eliminate red meat. Red meat, aside from it being pumped full of a lot of undesirables, has some quite unexpected uh, changes that occur in the body. Um, they can strip calcium out of the body because what happens is meat is rich in phosphorus and so the, bon uh, the body will form calcium phos uh, will, will form a, a compound called appetite which will remove calcium out of the body. And the other thing with meat is that it uh, slows the intestinal transit time right down. Normally, the ITT, the intestinal transit time, uh, that's the length of time it takes for something to go through you, should be 24 hours. In some people, it can be up to 72 hours. And um, I've even been in care homes where the, um, some of the inmates, I call them there, uh, have not had a bowel movement for two weeks. And they're just looking to blow, you know, just get out of the building. <laughs> Boom. And um, a lot of this, red meat can jam you up solidly. So bowel cleanses, 38. We use something called, um, in fact, this book here will tell you all about it outside, Digestive Health. Um, to clean the bowel out once every six to nine months, you'll notice now summer's going to be around on Monday, um, ladies, have a look around for the guys over 45 years of age. Um, have a look for the ones that have got a thin, le thin legs. They're wearing shorts at this point. Thin legs, thin arms, indicating a low body fat percentage, but they've got a big old gut coming out the front here. In most cases, you're looking at a monster colon packed with sludge. And I've spoken to some, uh, some of these pathologists around the, uh, the world, and they say, yep, in, in autopsies, we routinely scrape pounds and pounds of this junk out of the gut. And this can, of course, is a breeding uh, ground for all kinds of nasties, but also bowel cancer, which is a very unfunny problem in this country, uh, is one of the chief causes from this. It's, we've simply had too much Western civilization, eating too much food that is not really food at all. It's highly processed commercial material palmed off on the public as foodstuffs. One of the easiest ways of doing this is to uh, get a pot of the um, stuff in the blue pack out the back called magnesium oxide. It's got colonics written on it. It's magnesium oxide. Take a teaspoonful of this, whisk it up into a glass of water, and drink that when you get out of bed in the morning, when you're in your elimination cycle, and then get a white knuckle grip on the towel rail. <laughs> Whoosh! <laughs> and it all comes out. Crayons, coins, whatever's been in there. It's really not that bad, and the best time to start it is on a Saturday, so by Monday, you are into the rhythm of the whole thing. But um, trust me, I'm a doctor. No, I'm not. Trust me, you will not be running down the high street screaming for a toilet. It's actually, you know, not quite as dramatic as I've just portrayed. But it will liquefy everything in the digestive tract and shunt it out your afterburner. And uh, <laughs> very important, because down the road, you can end up with some of these really unfunny problems. They reckon 50%, they reckon 50% of people in this country have some sort of a, a yeast overgrowth problem, bowel problem. Thrush, jock itch, athlete's foot, scratching themselves in embarrassing places up the old Kent Road, all of that lot being fed with sugar. 
See, we're in trouble already, aren't we? Look at these diets we're feeding us, ourselves with. <laughs> Give yourself permission to recover. Professor Kathy Sykes, um, some of you remember her show, I think it was last year, called Alternative Health. She's a, a, a self-avowed skeptic on the power of the mind to heal people, but she wasn't at the end of that series. She uh, cited a, a Dr. Mosley in Colorado who used to give knee operations, and he would just cut the knee open and then scrape all the debris out and then sew it back up, put them into post-op care. But a group he had, he actually did the knee operation, but he didn't scrape the bits out. So the patient was aware they'd had the operation, but believed the bits had gone, and were put into post-op care. Both groups recovered at the same rate. Amazing, isn't it? And she cited many people having operations, you know, out in the uh, Asia without the use of anesthetic and so on. So the mind, we, we, we don't even tap the mind in this country. We hear about all this energy wastage, but how about thought wastage? You think about the power of this. Juice veggies. Um, juicing veggies is one of the best ways of alkalizing the body. Now, remember, an alkalized body is a healthy body. It absorbs large amounts of oxygen. This was the, this was the basis of Otto Warburg's Nobel Prize for medicine in 1931. What he said was, alkalized solutions absorb oxygen, acidic solutions repel oxygen. If you are an alkalized body system, cancer, for instance, cannot dwell in your body because cancer cannot dwell in the presence of oxygen. And the acidic system is the disease system. So if that's you, there are things you can start doing tomorrow if you have a mind to it. Who's got a juicer? Okay, get the juices. Don't juice fruit. Have you noticed that fruit is acidic? Fruit, if you eat it, will convert to alkali. If you eat it, but if you juice 10 oranges, have you ever done that? Juice 10 oranges and then drunk the juice right back. You feel like you swallowed a marine distress flare. <laughs> Not sensible. And lots of sugar go in with that as well. So you've got to juice veggies. The greens are the best. Um, cabbage, kale, spinach, broccoli, beans, even the gladiator of vegetables, Brussels sprouts. Make them have it. Get a juicer, by the way, that's got some teeth on it. We've got some good ones outside. Um, don't get that 20 quid Argos thing. Absolutely pathetic. We, we tested these juices about two years ago, and that thing, the moment you even shook a cabbage at it, it exploded. You know, blades flying everywhere, kids running around with bleeding ears. You've got to really chew up the veggies, and this is not going to replace eating real food. This is a way of getting a lot of high, um, high enzyme chlorophyll, uh, high volume uh, enzymes into the system, and lots of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll converts to hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the oxygen-carrying truck in your blood. So there's one way to maximize the oxygen uptake uh, in your body while you're going out there and also exercising. And exercising is not walking. It's not walking Fifi around the cricket pitch. It's getting out there and going up the tour, up the road here, and coming down, being out of breath. If you don't do that, if you shy away from exercise, oh, I don't do exercise, suffer what you must suffer because you've got the, the same body as everybody else, but if you choose culturally not to do that, you're going to have trouble. Maria Costantino's got an excellent juicing book out the back, full color, full of all of the just dozens and dozens of juicing recipes, complete with their own medicinal properties. Own a good conscience. Be blameless. There's an idea. How about living tomorrow blamelessly? No comeback. Exercise prevention doesn't mean prevent yourself exercising. It means don't get sick in the first place. Health Wars, the ABCs, and Food for Thought will help you do that. Grab a brochure, by the way. You don't have to buy any of this stuff tonight. Just take the brochure home. Take a couple of those DVDs and CDs home with you. Have a look at them as well. And uh, see which part of you needs fixing. Deal with addictions. We deal with that in the Little Book of Attitude. If you've got something that you need to get rid of, um, we use aversion therapy as one of the most effective ways of doing that. When I learned to speak in public, uh, I went to one of those posh schools, Charterhouse, I thought it was posh, but they never used to turn the heating on in the winter. They used to flog you warm every morning. <laughs> when they used to teach you public speaking, lots of us had these speech ticks like, um, uh, sort of, sort of. And there was this one maniac who, who took us for this. He was a 75-year-old white. He looked like the guy, you know, the, the professor of um, Back to the Future, you know, that guy, Christopher Lloyd? He looked just like him. He was a nutcase, this guy. And he used to get you to stand up with Virgil's Aeneid, and you used to have to read out in Latin with your hand out, and he'd stand by you with a ruler. And the moment you went, um, he went, bang, on your hand. And you were like, Ooh! And, of course, it was the guy thing not to have grown or anything. But he got rid of that whole habit in four days, just simply with pain. What do you know about today? We, no pain anymore, is there? There's no beatings and floggings. It's not interesting anymore, is there? There's no hangings at all. Not at all. I don't know, you know, if we could whiz back 500 years now and see what the good folk of Glastonbury would think about our society today, I think they'd be 
quite, quite amazed at how things have gone. But the point is, the brain, just because health and safety say they shouldn't do that, the brain responds to pain and pleasure. You don't have to be medieval about it, but you just need to get the point across to the brain that this is what I'm going to link pain to, and this is what I'm going to link pleasure to. And there's actually a way, and I'll show you this in the Attitude book, how you can bring in those things into your life, those habits, um, that you need to install, must go to the gym, must be healthy, must do this, must do that. And then you can throw those habits out that have been bugging you, simply using aversion therapy in this pain and pleasure format. Avoid national media, 31, we've looked at that. There is danger in excess, moderation in all things. Okay, so if you look like this, <laughs> the chances are you're doing something to excess. It's... <laughs> It's a good idea, to actually. To, it's a good idea to actually debrief your life. Have a think about all those. Think about that part, the, the portions of your life that you don't have control over. There you are. That's put it seriously to you, isn't it? Which part of you have you not got control over? All of it. I got the other day. I have no control over any of my life. Yeah, which part of you have no control over? That's the area that needs working on. So in Simple Changes, where we do these hundred things, I'm running through most of them or a lot of them right now. Have a look at those areas you're having trouble with, and, and the book will give you some healthy ways and some, uh, some decent ways to uh, proceed. Obtain control over your sense of certainty. This simply means know that you know why you do what you do. If you want to defeat cancer using nutrition and lifestyle changes, you better believe it. This is the whole placebo effect in addition to the good you're doing with the ministrations you're giving your body. So people come along to my meetings sometimes or, or they'll say something like, um, well, actually, Philip, I'm not the one who's got cancer. Uh, Uncle Jack's got it. All right, well, where's Uncle Jack? Oh, he couldn't come tonight. He's told, he sent me along to find out and then report back to him. No, Jack, that's not the way you do it at all. You've got to be here and you've got to, get, uh, you've got to actually get into obtaining control over your sense of certainty about this or don't even bother with it. It's the same with businesses. If you're starting up a business... And um, you know what my mum said? She said, when I was looking to set up Credence Publications all those years ago, she said, don't waste your time. Get a sensible job with the Maidstone Borough Council. <laughs> Today, I employ my mother. And every time I give her a paycheck, I make sure that she eats crow. <laughs> if you're going to do a business, do it, or just don't waste your time and everybody else's. Does that make sense to you? Get stuck in. Faith changes your biochemistry. That's the placebo effect right there. Climb stairs whenever you can, then climb them again. When Sam and I are doing all these hotels all over the world, um, one of the best ways we get the exercise is we run up and down the stairs, or we climb up the stairs and we come down again, then we go back up again, then we come down again, by which time there's usually a security guard, and then we go back up again. <laughs> and, and this, you'll, you'll start to get out of breath, and that's galvanizing the metabolism. That's exercise. They've even agreed that walking is technically not exercise because it does not raise the heart rate. Then people say, well, I power walk. <coughs> Fine, but make sure the heart rate's up. It's very important, and stair climbing is one of the good ways of doing that. Avoid sugar and fat-free. What this means is sugar, of course, you know, I don't need to get into, but there's, uh, the sugar substitutes can be every bit as bad. One of the big ones is Monsanto's brain poison, aspartame. So avoid that like the plague. And uh, anything that says... Uh, sugar-free or fat-free, avoid those like the plague. Don't break the law. The law, my mum's a magistrate, or used to be, when she gave up in disgust because she couldn't flog and hang anybody anymore. <laughs> but the law is often an ass, but it is the law. And if we want to change the law, well, you know, we're not going to resort to revolution just yet, but the law is the line drawn in the sand beyond which we should not go. If we want it changed, then we have to act en masse, and, and we're not that great at doing that as a country. And we need to start doing that. We tend to be a bit parochial in the way we do that. But don't break the law. You think less of yourself when you do it. Finding the right person is being the right person. So lots of people are saying, oh, I deserve the best person in the world for me. And uh, Rhonda Byrne's book, The Secret. Anybody read that? Okay, The Secret. I like Rhonda's book. I don't agree with all of it. The one bit that raised my uh, eyebrows a bit was, uh, food can't make you fat unless you think it can. Well, Rhonda, I've got a big box of donuts here. So let's... Uh, have a go, see whether we can stuff these full of you and measure your pounds being put on. But I, what I like about uh, her book is that she gets into the thought life in some detail and uh, looks at how that affects us. Dare to dream. 
dare to dream. I knew a guy once who um, wanted to own his own 747, uh, but uh, he didn't have the money, so he decided to build one instead. Very large model. <laughs> Mad, dare to dream. Be inspired. Be inspired. There's an awful lot of dead people. We've got the walking dead. You go around Maidstone, it's dead. People are still breathing. They can fog a mirror, but they're, they're dead emotionally. Avoid dream killers. We're into the home straight now. Avoid dream killers. Now, uh, a dream killer, there's probably one sitting next to you right now. <laughs> Has that put the cat among the pigeons? Dream killers, uh, dream killers are people, generally members of your family, um, who don't want you to fail, so they toss any good idea you've got under the bus. Generally, it's because they themselves have failed, and they project in the failure onto you. But avoid dream killers. Avoid people who just say it can't be done. Now, there is the other side of this. Don't be reckless. If you've got a good business idea or even a harebrained one, then run it by some disinterested third parties or people who know what they're doing. But family is generally not good at doing this. So lots of you, if you've got some great ideas or there are some different directions you want to head in in your life, avoid the naysayers, but get somebody who is just clinically dispassionate about the whole thing, who's got no axe to grind with you one way or the other, and ask them in, instead. Enjoy silence. One of the best ways that we can calm down in terms of uh, stress is to just relax. You can pray, you can meditate, you can put yourself into an alpha pattern, maybe uh, deeper than that. The deeper sections go into hypnosis, of course, the hypnosis uh, uh, layers. Silence is very, very important for recharging. It's important also when you sleep, you haven't got the dog and duck chucking out at one o'clock in the morning as well, yelling and screaming and tossing bottles down the street. And how many people find themselves driving around in a car with the radio on all the time? You know, or, you know, you go into a house and there's the TV on all the time. And this is stopping the brain doing this. So try something tomorrow. Next time you get in the car, try driving around with nothing on. <laughs> Start complaining. Not stop complaining. Am I the only one to th uh, who's realized that the service has gone out of this country? It's just, you can't get a plumber when you want one anymore. I mean, plumbing is a very, very responsible, uh, very responsible, urgent job, which in my view is why plumbers should not do it. But anyway, plumbing, can't get a plumber anymore. And when they do turn up, they charge the earth. We, we've been trying to get our uh, kitchen replumbed. It's a nightmare. There's no service in this country anymore, and people have stopped complaining. We've just ended up being dumb, bovine, and acquiescent about the whole thing. Now, let's get the service back in and start r raising some hackles and, uh, and, and, get, uh, and get that back. Touch base with somebody who thinks you've forgotten them. Think about all the people you meet as you cruise through life. Touch base with somebody who thinks you've forgotten them. It's a nice thing. I got a phone call the other day from... Uh, a friend of mine I hadn't seen for years and years and years. Lives in Colorado now, Aspen of all places. And it was just great because I don't know why these, these things, why you touch base with people like this, but you do. And it's good because it's a part of your life that's now gone, but you can just go back and say, oh, remember when? Important. Dental health. How many people know that rotten teeth can translate into cancer and heart disease? Because they can. So if you've got weeping, root canals, root canal problems, Dr. Weston Price, a famous doctor, I'm sorry, dentist, used to take uh, rotten teeth and this was in the days when they did this to animals, and if he, if he sewed it under the skin of a rabbit, the rabbit got cancer. Or the rabbit ended up with some serious illness from the infected tooth. The, uh, the, the miles and miles of, of tubules in the teeth contain bacteria. You never get rid of them all. So if you've had the root removed from the tooth, you've essentially got a mummified tooth in your head, and the bacteria has no way of getting out of that. And so this can start to severely impair immunity. And we have a book written by one of the top dentists around called Toxic Bite on our website. So if teeth are a problem with you, there's a, a section that you need to look at. There's uh, Bill's book. Read a good book. I mean, read all my books, but read a good one. Um, fiction, again, is a bit like a hobby. It gets you away from the old daily grind. And it's escapism of sorts if you get into that. So it's a nice, relaxing... And when you read a book, you are also in that alpha pattern. And that's where the imagination starts to come alive. Give to charities that do the job. Most charities don't give another penny to a cancer charity because that money just gets passed back to the drug companies to continue to follow the wrong course with the maximum of precision. The only uh, cancer charity I would recommend giving to is the World Cancer Research Fund. I'm not a director or a beneficiary of it at all, but they are a great uh, charity and they concentrate on nutrition, 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 and also getting the poisons and gunk out of our society. Forget the lottery. It's a tax on greed. 
I got a letter the other day. I'm depressed, Philip, and I think the only way I'm going to get out of this chronic financial situation is if I win the lottery. Uh, come up with a better plan than that. The problem with the lottery, again, is going to be not only the odds just stellar. Uh, apparently, the odds of winning the lottery are about the same as gravity failing you. They actually, do you know, scientists actually worked out that there is actually um, a possibility of, of you waking up tomorrow morning stuck to the ceiling. <laughs> you have to be educated to be that stupid. You couldn't get there on your own, could you? You'd need at least six years in a university to spend the public's money working that out. <laughs> Forget the lottery, it's a tax on greed. Be thankful. Be a parrot. Enjoy music. Isn't that a nice one? Music is very, very uh, spiritual, atavistic. And there's music that heals, and there's music... How many people know there's music that kills? Yeah, we've done a whole study on this in the mind game. It's quite a fascinating thing. Music that can kill you, as well as music that can heal. Music plugs into us in a way that we don't even understand yet. Uh, it's a very, very atavistic in that way. Help others. Congratulate them on their achievements. Help others... You may, the, you may be the only one doing it. There have been several times during my career when I've been harassed. I did, uh, um, you know, harassed, kicked. I was kicked out of America at one point after being thrown in jail for the AIDS project. They hated what I had to say about that. And uh, there have been times when I just thought, this isn't worth it. I just want to throw the towel in and go off and farm Christmas trees in Montana or something. And then all of a sudden I'll get an email. Dear Philip, my wife Sandra has just got the all clear from her cancer. Just wanted to write you a note and say thank you very much. Boom! Immune system maximized, underpants on the outside, you know, you're off, <laughs> back, on the, back on track again. And he probably had no idea that he had that effect on me, but you know what I'm saying, that some, you know, uh, the great cosmos will send somebody along to you, you know, sometimes when you really need to have that happen. So pass that around, make sure, um, congratulate others on their achievements. But here's the other side, don't overpraise children. They've got nothing but contempt for you. When you go and give a kid 29% and you give him an A, he has nothing but contempt for you, number one. Number two, more dangerously, he calls into contempt the entire system. And now you've got a whole bunch of kids growing up outside what we would regulate, what we would regard as society, because we've sat there with this horrible whole concept of just overpraising kids all the time. Um, in my view, what kids need to do is they need to be challenged. Again, you don't have to be medieval with them, but you need to challenge them and let them fail, let them fail, let them fail, then let them succeed, and then they understand the currency of success. Does that make sense? Let them do that, because they're not doing that. Yeah. And lastly, you didn't think I'd get there, but I have. Have a point to it all. Leave a legacy. What, it is all, what has it all been for? Have a think about that. It often helps when you're planning each day. Some people set 10-year goals, they set 20-year goals, but, well, how would I like to be remembered? That's the whole thing. And I was thinking about that the other day, and as I was driving down the road, I was coming back from a meeting in Ashford, and I came around a corner, and I almost got hit by a Mr. Whippy van. And it would have been a bad one. I mean, you would have seen it in the papers. Philip Day hit by a Mr. Whippy van. That's how I was, would have been remembered. So please pay attention when you're driving, because the subconscious sometimes isn't enough for that. But just think about what... It's nice to sum up your life in a way. Just have a think about it, and uh, have a point to it all. The book is Simple Changes. There's also the, 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 the um, CD out there, There Must Be an Easier Way. It was recorded in one of our colossal meetings down in Melbourne. They're mad down there, by the way. Um, when we go down to Australia, they turn up in their thousands. Sometimes we have to hire indoor sports stadiums to get them all in. We speak to four to 8,000 people in Melbourne uh, of a weekend. I think it's because nobody ever goes to visit them down there. <laughs> they're stuck all the way down there, and um, you, nobody visits them down there, but it's great. Anyway, this is the, uh, there must be an easier way, which was um, what Evil Knievel said before his abortive leap across the Grand Canyon. And um, there must be an easier way to avoid dying badly and avoid having a lot of the pitfalls that we've skimmed across tonight. And um, also, if you'd like to get free updates, every week I send out a free week, weekly health tip. So if you're on the internet and you'd like to receive that, just um, grab one of those brochures outside and look in the inside cover and just fill that form out and give it to Samantha if you want to do it now, or just simply log on to philipday.com and join the Campaign for Truth in Medicine for free, and um, you'll get our monthly bulletin and also the weekly health tips as they go out, and uh, lots of good stuff there. Let's uh, wrap up now because we're just about on time. Um, 
One of my mentors, a guy called Jim Rohn, he says this, and I'll pass this on to you. Let others lead small lives, but not you. Let others argue over small things, but not you. Let others cry over small hurts, but not you. Let others leave their future in someone else's hands, but not you. Thank you. Philip Day, everybody. Thank you very, very much. Fantastic stuff. Fantastic.